Ask him for it. A Novel Approach. Episode 10. Chapter 38. It's been a long and necessary campaign encouraging interest in devolving men's powers and elevating the superior, the more reasonable, sex. On rare occasions, the SDMP still holds its nuit blanche, evenings on which the uninitiated are welcomed to the august street heart residence in Toronto or to one of several other locations in cities on three continents. Invited by members, these uninitiated are given an introduction to the precepts motivating the SDMP's project of male disempowerment. Each will already have demonstrated some natural inclination, but the basic tenets of historical matriarchies are gone over for good measure. Contemporary issues of environmental destruction, social and political strife, all the woes attributable to excessive male ego and aggression, lumped together, constituting a damning call for renewed evolutionary zeal. Evolutionary zeal, hopefully more enduring than the revolutionary brand. Following this introduction, prospective members' duties are foregrounded. Chief among these is contributing to the archive, all aspiring to join in the noble project must undertake the research and writing of a book, a book on a theme relevant to the Society's work. Jim's own early contribution, Kabele Mother, The Hidden Hand That Guides, had a print run of 5,000 and can still be found on university library shelves, as well as on the Society's own. It built upon his undergraduate work, once he abandoned the sadly skeptical tutelage of Oxford, his writings veered from the esoteric to the contemporary and political and back again on a regular basis. Subsequently, Jim's published another 11 volumes over the years. Long before the SDMP, before he'd donned his youthful scholar's weeds even, Young Jim's street heart intuited the existence of another order of human life. This conviction, more profound with the years gone, still animates Jim's in his sixties. The years spent elaborating bridges between ancient wisdoms and our contemporary plight has opened Jim's up to considering radical solutions. Especially in a time when governments encourage ignorance, and when outright misogynist propaganda is only very gradually abating, in a time like this, even the rash, the superstitious, and semi-literate can withstand a dose of reason. Evolution is the tent big enough for all. With hearts in the right place, i.e. opposed to men's pig-headed follies, even the reticent can be groomed as evolutionaries. Cannon fodder, you could almost say, for the society's war on chauvinism. The slipperiest slope. The descent from pleasure into obsession and worse. The subject had troubled Jim's his life through. His father had crafted his own dissolute behavior. He dovetailed it neatly with his utter deference to Jim's mother. The contemporary substance abuser practices intoxication and self-destruction with less grace and yet with an eerie familiarity. That noted, Dionysian is a term bandied about far too freely these days. Today's drunks and drug addicts hardly seem worthy descendants of the devoted Attis, much less his divine Greek counterpart Dionysus. Still, the sad excesses of today's substance abusers do have their resonance with the orgies of antiquity. The rites of Kabele Mata involved ecstatic frenzy and self-castrations in her honor. The overzealous masochist, left unenlightened, finds his own ruination with alarming speed. Unchecked, the absence of self-regard undercuts the instinct 
to self-preservation. The SDMP archives include countless accounts and analyses, charting, then channeling young people's impulses away from the self-destructive, has remained a Jim's Streetheart pet project for many years. The SDMP promotes study and support groups in every house they've established. Chapter 39 Manfred Meekness sits beneath a cool sliver of early morning sky, under the fire escape behind his peeling yellow stucco building. The city is a slumbering giantess, its delicate respiratory system peacefully wheezing in sync with the ocean at her feet. Through its only window, the one he has just climbed out through, Meekness can see back into his rented room. Framed almost perfectly in the window, his old Smith Corona portable sits on a diminutive cafe-style round table, more of a little pedestal, really. He can almost make out the porous texture of its grey-green carry case. The lid is open, revealing the well-oiled hammers and gears beneath the ranked, glossy tiles on its keys. He must edge carefully around this cipher of his creative process just to get out of that window, as he has this morning. Less than eight feet side to side, this diminutive, seagull-spattered annex serves meekness for a studio. He shifts his scrawny buttocks uncomfortably on the upturned packing crate, nearly toppling his laptop and coffee. His wistful gaze no longer focused, he reflects upon his best years, years spent working the gears and hammers of his trusty Smith Corona, working through the profound and the desolate, the frenetic and the desperate, siren-filled L.A. nights. For years, a smiling, naked, insomniac muse lured him into nocturnal fields, flowering with possibility. Then she began sleeping around. For a brief but ominous period, she refused even to undress, stood arms akimbo in his doorway, a cruel editorial whip clasped in one hand. Eventually, the muse tired of the meager accommodations altogether, forsaking meekness in his squalid string of rented rooms. Today, he takes his cues from a host of variously creative producer-slash-director types. They expect alchemical miracles worked upon fool's gold for a fool's pay, and meekness is their man. The muse of his youth, long ago happily married off, still drops by for the occasional pity fuck. He needs a jug of red to recover from her casual visitations these days. What are you going to do? Aging, they say, is not for the faint of heart. Writers can be no exception. Meekness contemplates the pallid underside of one scrawny, Sixty-year-old wrist. He resists the temptation of fingering it for a pulse, then completes rolling up his sleeves to address his most recent and most unlikely petitioner. That schoolboy apparition has disappeared back into the eastern fogs whence he came. The dog's breakfast of a manuscript Abierte left behind him has migrated from coffee table to cafe and back now for a week. There is enthusiasm in it, something meekness envies bitterly. There are interesting events, a couple of nascent characters even. So be it. Okay, petitioner. Since it seems you've done so little prep work yourself, I've occupied myself parsing this thing out from scratch. There is the aspect of fetishism, foot fetish, fight fetish, female domination, sexualized and otherwise. Eh, that might be a different thing altogether. 
On one hand, the dominatrix herself represents the consummate fetish object. And here, let's say we speak of origins. An object used by tribal peoples as an amulet or charm for protection, for example. It is only ironic that our heroine is generally punitive in her attitude toward the fetishist. In all other ways, she functions as pure magic, completing his psychological universe, squaring the wobbly circle of his troubled self-image. Then again, there's an entire philosophical matrix supporting your Michaela. Individuals are not alone in fetishizing the dominant female. The whole of Western society may now have veered to her veneration after centuries, maybe millennia, of variations on themes of male chauvinism. In our fall from rationalism, there's the implicit urge to submerge. The drowning days of our greatest male failings, if you will. Then there's advertising, our society's unerring weather vane. It has assimilated the female on top paradigm, comic, terrifying, provocative, sexually titillating. Bossy women are promoting the products and services that surround us day in, day out. And the entire entertainment business is climbing onto the bandwagon. If you count genuine literary products as progenitors of today's reality TV, online gaming, pulp cinema, etc., well, perhaps we rolled out the bandwagon longer ago than I've surmised. Among us writers, there has always been cheerleaders for La Femme Supérieure. Sacher Massac was neither first nor last to prostrate himself. Venus in furs, La Belle Dame sans merci, Artemis, the silver moon huntress. Beauty and cruelty in female form can hardly do otherwise than to dominate. Yes, pa? But then, your average writer's melding of these traits owes nothing more to reality than your average pie in the sky. Have you searched Honestly, dear petitioner, honestly enough for this chimera of yours? On the upside, people are eating it up, and understandably so. We Americans are nothing if not gluttonous consumers of pies. For every old-school tough guy hero these days, there's a cadre of girls with dragon tattoos, well-positioned to kick his hero ass. Novelty is the lifeblood of entertainment, and your Michaela may just have that edge, primarily because we've been fed so exclusively on macho heroes. She needn't be merely superior. She can be downright anti-hero as well. She doesn't just kick ass. She kicks man-ass. And I can't stress enough, this should be with little regard for the man's intrinsic good or badness. As the millennial anti-hero, she can be cruel with near impunity. Why not? At least where men are concerned. In the benighted West, there's misogyny aplenty yet to be redressed. So, remember the anti-hero from freshman composition class? The hero short on heroic attributes? Well, our new heroine could actually redefine the anti-hero, which is in itself very cool. She can attack directly what inwardly bothers us about the hero. The heavily armed Tomb Raider was maybe only a harbinger of this age's new agent of retribution. She was sexy, wearing the traditional garb of the bad guy. A white satin Lara Croft would have languished on the cutting room floor, after all. In black leather, gunmetal, and carbon fiber, she expressed her sexual persona in a language men understand. 
violent technologies, seduction in aggression. So Angelina opened a door our Michaela can swagger through, meeting out abuse without apology. What's most wicked is she can even kick the underdog, the ultimate hero. How does she get away with it? Maybe, as a jaded society, we're bored with the charms of the underdog, his guilt-inspiring righteousness. We're over him. Our new anti-heroine can still take down the villains, but it's her dark side disdain for the hero's goody goodiness that's most interesting. The Swedish girl with the tattoo was irreverent before all the established wielders of power, but she still needed to right wrongs done to herself or others. Here in America, we're the living avant-garde. Michaela can dish it out, and we're just going to take it. Because in America, men are men. We're brutes and doofuses, or we're hardly men at all. Again, look at the advertising. Look at the sitcom. Men are always wrong, usually laughably wrong. Their long-suffering mates roll their eyes. Or we're evil and conniving, less laughable, but even better targets for revenge. Either way, we are men, tarred with the same brush, stuck here, powerless to defend ourselves. Michaela will easily evade moral censure because we men invite abuse, wittingly and otherwise. How much of this twist can we credit to newly, truly wicked women? Our trending toward female dominance in the zeitgeist is significantly the work of male creative types predisposed to capitulation in their own private war of the sexes. Sound like anyone you know? And just here, something strikes meekness, in the manner of so many of his mature inspirations, a practical little insight that might just pave things some little ways toward the desired destination. Far cry from the forced milking his muse of old would treat him to, but then, he thinks, old beggars make the poorest choosers. Back to the petitioner. Here's a concept. Bargain s and The young and the generally less affluent cannot afford a good thrashing, even if they decide that's what they really need. Mature dominatrix equals big bucks, and no sale pricing, ever. The premium exacted for her services makes of the masochist a doubly regrettable rube. Not only does he serve a pitiless mistress, his desire is deemed aberrant and worthy of public ridicule. His needs are no harder to service than those of the typical suck-and-fuck crowd, and arguably they are less hazardous. Nonetheless, the subservient is taxed royally for his sorry psychic makeup. Here's a, a story seed. How about this? Plight of a young masochist at the mercy of his initially reluctant bully, and or the magnanimity of this bully in eventually offering her punishments wholesale. Oh, and lest you seriously consider your own aging and obsolete case to be of interest to a paying audience, I recommend keeping it young and beautiful. Victims and their abusers alike. Eternal youth. You know, it never goes out of fashion. Ah, by the by, your manuscript. This morass of sentiment and sidelong observation has been hard enough to read. I'm guessing it'll be even harder to eat. I recommend sending me another little stipend if you don't receive more news from me soon. My charity overreaches my powers to deliver work on an empty stomach, petitioner. 
Your frugality is strong, but my body is unwilling. P.S. How much all this plays to men's latent homosexual urges, I'll leave you to grapple with. Enjoy meekness. Chapter 40 Teddy is working at home, and as always, Teddy is at home in her work. She writes for the Lucy, Port St. Lucie's alternative weekly magazine, eight to ten film reviews per week. She also writes an unabashedly lesbian-inflected horoscope column, recently picked up for national syndication. Thinly veiled sexuality advice for youth. The column's mass appeal stems from Teddy's high-handed style and her extreme curtness in delivery. Why beat around the bush when rude and lewd sells so well? Her average reader took an average of 1.5 minutes to consume their daily dose of literary content today, down from a full hour 25 years ago. As far as Teddy is concerned, touchy-feely discourse must have gone out of fashion back around the 70s. Now, if someone hasn't been insulted in the opening sentence or two, no one is happy. Not her average reader, and certainly not the naturally acerbic B.T. Chilton. The sun is having its way with Teddy's air conditioner again. Given its overwhelming influence, Teddy prefers to think of the sun as an altogether female entity. As a writer, she routinely takes liberties with conventions of all sorts, traditional anthropomorphisms among them. Blurring gender lines be damned. Just redraw them and have done with it. It's a point of honor. Dozing in the sun, by the sliding doors, Teddy's dog is a living example. An easy hundred pounds of tan and white brawn, haunches like a horse's, chest broad and deep, jowls massive. You'd never call this mastiff slash pit bull a bitch. If you didn't know her already. Most every stranger to admire Tipper has mistaken her for a male. Teddy is currently in the midst of a love-hate relationship with that term, bitch. She hated the denigrated bitch, weak-willed, dupe of men, compensating with venom and avarice. Conflated with the canine, the rapper's bitch is even worse. Another step in the wrong direction. That bitch takes verbal abuse like a good ass-fucking. Seems like Americans have been calling each other bitches forever now. The term should really be properly desexualized. Online, where the femdom community applies the term bitch to submissive men, oh yes, she's been doing her research there too, since Michaela piqued her interest. Even there, it sometimes leaves a bad taste in her mouth, specifically when it's used interchangeably with sissy or faggot. Across the range of its manifestations, the abuse of men still too often suggests their feminization. Old-school leather and latex dominatrixes, housewife and schoolmarm disciplinarians, riding mistresses, they all have their bitches, men that crave their abuse. And there are many more contemporary variations on the man-beater theme the humiliatrix, the mental manipulatrix, tease and deniers, financial doms, hypno-doms, fetish blackmailers, sissy trainers and animal trainers, bully girl jocks and bratty schoolgirl princesses. There are those specializing in shredding a man's hide, depriving oxygen to the brink of asphyxiation, reducing them to human doormats, ashtrays, garbage cans, or even toilets. The depths at which some of the, her sisters can accommodate these sorry individuals awes and even worries Teddy a little. 
Not as though there aren't some sick little puppies in the LGBT set. But she's always felt even her most servile sisters are still looking for love. Sisters. Funny that. Male or female, her people, in all their magnificent variety, are not one thing. Men. Being a man long ago became synonymous with all things chauvinist and retrograde. If some of her sister's consensually kinky activities involved appropriating some unsavory mannishness, well, so be it. Life does have its mysteries. Playing away from men, the consensual can get downright gnarly without anyone getting hurt, so to speak. By contrast, the sorry male souls wallowing in their subhuman abasements must realize they've sunk well below what's lovable. And then, of course, there is Michaela. And this is where the love part of the love-hate relationship comes in. Michaela brings it all too close to home. Desexualizing be damned To be her bitch would definitely be sexual. It would be sexual if you did nothing more than butter her toast at breakfast. But damn it, it would be love as well. The idea alone is too hot to handle. Work's gone out the window now. Teddy's mind has wormed its way back toward Michaela. The AC is good for shit. She'll have to sit her fanny in a bucket of ice before she gets anything constructive on paper today. God damn it, Tipper, get over here. We're going for a walk. 